Hey, good morning. I can't see half of you in the back because I'm blinded. They told me not to squint up here. So I'll just keep my eyes real wide. <laughs> now, but I, my name's Angela, and uh, the last time I was up here was for the Ladies Echo Conference. Anybody here for that? Woo woo. Okay, awesome. So, you know, I'm honored to be back, and I don't take this position lightly. It's, it is a high honor to come up here and share the word. Um, and I know that uh, as Pastor Kyle and Jess and their entire family are on their Sabbath rest, you know, Kyle, if you're watching, Jess, we just pray for you that you come back to us rested and just recuperated and that, uh, you know, you're ha- everything's going peacefully there. No fighting, no arguing, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> But uh, I, speaking of family, I have to show the obligatory family photo here. You got that? Yes, that's the Johnson Five. That's uh, my husband, Derek. I can never remember how long we've been married because we dated for so long. So I think it's 15 years, yeah. Um, and then I've got Elliot, he just turned 11. And Elias, he's nine. And respectively, Elliot is in a size 11 and a half men's shoe and Elias is in a men's nine. So I'll be collecting shoes outside in the lobby after service because the, the price of shoes for adults is exponentially higher than for children. And then you can see who rules the family in the center. That's Eleanor, where they ha- we have the three E's. She's the s- sassy little one, feisty, but uh, she, her name means shining light and she is every bit of that. So that's, regardless of whatever I've been doing, uh, whatever job I've ever had, whatever role in ministry I've ever had, that they're my first ministry. And they are my, that's my highest honor to be Derek's wife and to be their mamas. So, okay, with that, I just wanted to give a little bit of an intro about myself. My journey to teaching and preaching has been a little strange. Uh, my last paid employed job before entering into full-time, I always use a caveat, vocational ministry because How about all of life is ministry, right? But my last paid job before I entered into full-time ministry was as a labor and delivery nurse. So now I just say, instead of delivering babies, I'm delivering the word. How about that? (laughs) But uh, before I became a nurse, I was in corporate wellness. Uh, Nursing was actually a second degree for me. I went back as an adult. That was insane. I was actually pregnant with my first during that whole program. I did a 13-month bachelor's program, so I don't recommend that. (laughs) But but I know that I have a love for learning, and God has just blessed me with a gift for being a student. Not everybody likes to learn or likes to be a student, but I do. But before I became a nurse, I was in corporate wellness, and I used to work locally here. My biggest client was AEP. And downtown, we would do, I was crafting curriculum for corporate centers, so either in a boardroom or a classroom. So teaching has always been in my blood. Whether I was in the secular or the sacred, I've always had a teacher's heart. So much so that, here's my shameless plug, I, I dedicated five years of my life to writing a Bible study. It's called Fruitful. It's out there in the lobby if you're interested. If you've ever done a traditional Bible study, it follows that very, very much the, the format. But I, I just wanted to write something because I knew the journey that God had done within my heart to, to learn to love his word. And I wanted to produce something that would help other people learn to love his word too. So shameless plug. But Ephesians 4.11 talks about the specific spiritual gifts that God has given people within ministry and the, the opportunity to uh, have influence over people. And there's five, it's the five-fold ministry, if you've ever heard of that. But apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, or pastors, that's very much what Pastor Kyle's anointing is, um, and then teachers. And so I feel like that, that's at my core. So even though you're in church this morning, I'm going to take you to school. It's been a while for some of you guys. (laughs) But your lesson today, we're in the series of the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm going to pick up where both Pastor Kyle and Pastor Todd and Pastor Mel have all been giving us the lessons of the Beatitudes. And so today... We're going to be talking about the seventh beatitude, and that's in Matthew 5, 9. So if you're a note taker, that's where we are, okay? Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children 
of God. And so the first thing that we have to understand when we look at this verse, and keep it up there for a minute, we've been talking about blessed are, so I don't think I need to belabor that, but that's the promise, that's the blessing, right? That's the, that's the if you do this, then you will be. So the peacemaker piece is where we're gonna really focus on today. And you have to understand that in this passage, it's one word, but it's a compound word. And before we can make peace, we have to understand what the heck peace is. It'd be, you know, like one of those cooking shows where there's three different chefs, like Iron Chef or whatever, they get five different ingredients and they're not given a recipe. And each one, they're gonna make something totally different from the other one, right? That's the high likelihood. So in order to make sure that we're making peace in a biblical sense, because how about, you know, there's a lot of ways to make peace that maybe, maybe not the way the Lord would want us to make it. But before we have to make that, we have to understand exactly what it is. So in its original Greek, I got a fun, fun Greek word because it's a New Testament, Greek. It's the compound word for peacemaker is irenapoios. Say that 10 times fast. And it means to make peace, to reconcile, and to establish harmony. And the two separate words that make up that compound word, the first is irene, and that means peace, and then poieo, which is maker. And so there's actually six biblical definitions of that one word in Greek, irene, peace. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be doing today. I'm gonna take you through the six biblical definitions. And you know, I really vacillated between, do I give them all six and then tell them how to make all six? You know, I, I, re- I said, okay, no, Lord, I think my mind works this way, so maybe yours will too. We're gonna to talk about the, the definition of peace and then how to make it. The definition of peace and then how to make it. Okay, so you can follow along that way. So the very first definition of peace is a state of national tranquility. And when I think of this, this was one of the first photos that came to my mind. You know what that one is? Pretty iconic, right? That's the victory over Japan Day, kiss in the streets, Times Square. It's symbolic of triumph of a nation after war. How about this one? Anybody remember this photo? 1973, when the first American POWs came home from on, onto U.S. soil from Vietnam. This is called title. This was a this was this won an award. It's called the Burst of Joy, and you see it. You see the immense emotion on the faces of the families being reunited with their loved one. How about this one to bring it a little closer to home? This is a mother with her son. Yeah, after his deployment, seven months deployed, he's an army paratrooper, he was a medic in the army paratroopers, seven months deployed in Iraq, coming home to US soil. Man, these get my heart every single time. I promise you that when I was watching, looking through all of these, I'm like, oh, this is so good. See, I'm a child of a veteran. My uh, dad flew Cobra helicopters for the United States Marines, but uh, I remember praying for months for his safe return after specifically the first Gulf War. And I I remember as a child tying those big yellow plastic ribbons around the tree in our front yard with my mom and my younger brother. And I even had like this copper bracelet with his stats on it. And I remember looking down at that every day just as a constant reminder that my dad wasn't home and I didn't know if he would return at all or when he would return. And it's this weird place that even a child can perceive when there's a lack of peace. When the nation is at war, even a child can perceive that. But then I also remember the intense joy that I would feel, that I did feel, because my dad went away on tour a couple times uh, on active duty. But we'd be at the, at the airport back when you could get right up there to the tarmac. You remember that? And I remember making this giant poster board sign that said, Welcome home, Dad. And being up there, just our whole family, just giddy with an anticipation, huddled together, waiting for him to take his first step off the tarmac. And just that feeling of just sweet relief that dad was home, right? 
Uh, and because I am a child of a veteran and we ha I have a long legacy of military service people, my grandfather, my grandmother was a army cadet nurse in World War II, so it's in my blood. So because of that, I'm gonna take some of my time right now to honor you. So if you are an active or a retired veteran of service of any kind, if you have clothed yourself in battle-ready gear of any kind, present, post, whatever, if you're in the, in the police, whatever, will you please stand right now so we can honor you? Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. We don't tell you guys that enough. Thank you for your service. You can be seated. You know, we just uh, celebrated our nation's most patriotic holiday, right? And we get this sentiment that America is the home of the free because of the brave. Kyle's message online was let freedom ring. We get this sentiment because every day, past and present, somebody, someone's loved one, clothes themselves in battle-ready gear and goes out and, and into enemy territory and risks their life to bring peace. So the next question is then, how, how do we make this type of peace? How do we make a national tranquility? How, does, how is national tranquility made? See, God is a God of love, right? God is a God of peace, but he's also the same God that flooded the world because the scriptures say in Genesis 6, 5 through 6, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. He's the same God that flooded the earth, and he's also the same God who hardened Pharaoh's heart and sent he sent them 10 deadly plagues to force the release of the chosen people in Exodus. And then he's also the same God that opened up the earth. Read about it. And it's in number 16. People say the Bible's boring. Are you kidding me? In number 16, he opened up the earth and swallowed up, that, and I quote, the people of Korah. Because those, they were the same chosen people that he had just rescued, but their hearts were just so bitter and evil and they were complainers and just the sin was rampant. So he, he's that same God. And that's just a few, first, you know, few highlights from the first three books of the Bible. <laughs> we can keep going. But he's a loving God, yes, but he's also a jealous God. And he's a God who will not be mocked. His judgment is swift and it's absolute. Second Peter 3, 9 says that God's desire is that none should perish though. It breaks his heart. It breaks his heart. But we also have to understand that his discipline is ultimately a loving act. Just like, you know, a parent. I don't know, since the start of summer, I just feel like this is all I've been doing. Stop that, stop that, please stop, come here. I've got them doing Bible verses and devotionals and all the things, worship music playing in the house because they're home. And so I feel like all day, every day, can I get an amen from the moms, the stay at home moms, that uh, you're disciplining constantly. And it's not, you're punishing, you're disciplining, you're correcting, you're redirecting, you're having conversations and, and rationalizing. It's exhausting. No parent wants to have to discipline their child. Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline, none, seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And this, guys, it's no exception for a nation. Often discipline is the means to an end. And with a nation that's often realized in worldwide pandemics, natural disasters, famine, and war. And how a nation responds to that discipline determines their future peace. I think we could talk about a whole message series on just this one alone. But that's the first one in a nutshell. What it is, national tranquility, and how to make it through the discipline. That's the recipe. We're talking about all the ways to make stuff. The recipe is discipline produces peace. All right, the second, the second biblical definition of peace 
is the peace between individuals. And I think this is the one that we think about more often. This is when I ask you right now in this moment, is there anyone that you are not at peace with? And this is a rhetorical question because I totally understand that he might be sitting next to you. I mean, they might be sitting next to you, (laughs) right? But this is where you have this, you know, tranquil feeling when you can honestly tell me, you know what, Angela, I feel good in my relationships. When I'm not in turmoil right now, like everything is at peace. That's this kind of peace. And if that's not you, and someone instantly came to your mind, I assure you, you are probably in the majority, but rest assured, there's hope. And we're going to talk about how we make this peace, but there's work that you got to do. All right. So I got a picture for you. Ever see any of these? I I actually have done this with my kids and it always results in laughter because like, you know, come on. (laughs) But I love the fact that these are like the, just like the faces on these kids as they're being shoved into this giant t-shirt. As I was looking for these photos, I mean, I went through the whole gamut of emotions preparing for this message today. I was crying and then I was like laughing, but there was shirts that people have pre-made for this very fact. And I'm like, oh, these people got too much time on their hands. But here's another one I got for you. Just like misery, right? (laughs) So, I mean, don't you wish it was still this easy with your family or your friends? Like, come on, she's getting the get along shirt. Let's like work this sucker out, right? So no, without being put into a get along t-shirt, there is a recipe to make peace between yourself and others. And I have to tell you this, when Pastor Kyle asked me to step in and teach today, There is no mistake in the fact that this is the beatitude that he was on in the series, the the peacemaking, because I think it's pretty much like this with all speakers or pastors or teachers. When God is bringing you a specific word, he usually takes you on a journey through it first. And this has been a journey for me for probably the last year and a half about having to make peace. I mean, it's been on repeat in my life. And because of that, I thought, okay, Lord, Usually when you come to bring something, a message or whatever, God usually not, he doesn't take you all the way through it because how about where none of us have fully arrived. But I, I've been working through peace and how to make it for about the, the better part of a year and a half. And I don't do it perfectly, but I'm more sensitive to it within the last you know, 12 months or so. And the three verses that he has repeatedly brought to my attention, I'm gonna share with you now. And these are the verses that he has brought to my heart for training, for correction, for conviction, And so I know some of you, someone popped up in your mind when I asked you that question. So take these verses to heart. Um, Maybe just one thing that I share with you today will settle in your spirit, and I pray that it does. But the first one I wanna share with you is Hebrews 12, 14. It says, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see God. Do we have this verse? Because I want to talk through it. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Well, we don't have it up, but the first part of this verse is to work at living in peace with, did anybody catch it? Everyone not just the people you get along with, not just the people that sound like you, think like you, look like you, live in your same area. Everyone. Already I'm tired. Already I'm like, really God? Pass, hard pass on that one. (laughs) Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that what? No poisonous bitter, no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. See, that's the thing. The root of bitterness does not infect or affect anybody else. It affects you. Like they're going on with their merry life, not even knowing how twisted up inside that you are every time that you look at their face or think of them, right? It's the root of bitterness that grows up in you and it, that it, it affects you and that it infects others because it spills out from you. You guys know those bitter Bettys in your life that are just like everything, just so negative. And it it spills out because it's in there. So 
I think that I wanted to share, you know, the next two verses because that first one gets me every single time. Do we have this one? Psalm 34, 14. We got this one. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So we're seeking it and then we're going after it. Like pursue. That's like, that's work on your part, right? You have to, it's not a passive process. And then the next one is Romans 12, 18. And I love the caveat here. I think that this is, a, this is God in his generosity recognizes that not every situation is just like cut and dry. This one, it says, if it is possible. Some of you, your hearts have been hurt. You have been seriously wounded by people who are supposed to care for you and love you. And they just were, they disregarded you and they did not treat you well. And some of you, it might not be really safe for you to have a one-on-one face-to-face interaction. So I think that that's just a generous caveat that God gives us in this passage. So if, if it is possible, and that's something that you have to ask yourself. That's when you put the mirror of reflection up to your own heart and you say, okay, God, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, everyone. And this is the one that gets me almost every time. And my husband and I, Derek and I, have done some, some counseling with couples or premarital stuff and, you know, or, or even couples that are, they're throwing around the divorce word. And this is the scripture that I always bring up. Have you exhausted every resource? Have you done everything within your power as far as it depends on you? Because I'll just use my, myself and my husband, Derek, as an example. When I stand and give an account for every thought, word, action, and deed that I've done, I don't stand up there with Derek. I, st- I stand solely up there with my Savior accountable for me in all the thoughts, the deeds, the actions, things unsaid and, and not said. And I think sometimes we can, we can uh, really use that, well, you know, it's always me that has to apologize, or he does this all the time, or she does this all the time. And I, I read something one, one time that just really changed my perspective on that. It said, you know, if, if they're 98% res- responsible for an argument, let's give them 99.9%. If you had a thought that was negative toward them or you responded in kind of a jerk way, that 0.1%, that's on you. you. You're responsible for that 0.1%. And that's something that you have to work out between you and, your, and, and the Lord and you and them. If it's as possible, if it's, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you. So the recipe for this one is to pursue peace with everyone. Okay, I'm gonna shake things up a little bit. This is the teacher in me, keep you on your toes. I used to make people stand up and do jumping jacks if I saw them falling asleep when I used to teach. I won't do that to you guys. But I'm gonna have some audience participation. And I've asked a couple ahead of time, so don't freak out. So this is, they, they have been, I've talked to, this is Jed and Monica, I've talked to them beforehand, but we're going to do, um, we've talked about this peacemaking thing. Hi guys. <laughs> we've talked about peacemaking and the latter part of the word uh, is poyeo and that's the maker piece and that, it clearly involves effort. It requires effort on our part. How long have you guys, you guys are married, how long have you guys been married? 21 years. Good. Did you know that? I did. Okay. <laughs> 21 years. Do you guys ever fight? Yes. Yes. Sure. Did you guys fight this morning? Uh, no. I don't. How about Sunday fights? Anybody get into Sunday fights? Like, God knows. Like, the enemy knows. You're going to go hear the word. And it's like every Sunday. Oh, right in the car. And then you come in here. You're like, oh, holy Jesus. We worship you. Shut your face. <laughs> Elbowing you. Okay. So, I, Jed, I want you over here. And Monica, I want you over here. Okay. I think where we get this one twisted a little bit is uh, it's not peacekeeping. Peacekeeping implies that peace already exists. Okay, so we're going to make some peace. This is your get along t shirt. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would never do that to them. <laughs> You're like trying to get into that shirt up here. Wouldn't that be awful? No, but. Peacemaking is so much harder than peacekeeping because it's, it, you have to make something from nothing. And I think that's why the blessing is for the peacemaker. Peacemaking says, you know what? You're going to come here and you're going to come here. And we're going to have this 
really awkward conversation. And this isn't easy for either one of us, but we're going to work because I don't want the bitter root to grow up within me and affect this relationship. And I don't want this bitter root to grow up within me and infect this relationship. It, it, it brings the two parties together and it says, you know what? I, I value and I want to make this work. It's, it's uncomfortable, right? It's, it's awkward. How about two hands? Derek and I, when we did our premarital counseling, the counselors told us to hold hands when we fight. That's really uncomfortable and get out of here. But it's really hard to throw a blow when you're holding the hands, right? <laughs> But it's, it's, it, this is where it has to happen, the making, the peacemaking, together, coming together. All right, thank you guys for that visual. They would have died if I made them put this T-shirt on. But peacekeeping implies that it already exists, and, you, and, and you're maintaining something that's already in effect. And peacekeeping is like, you know, are you okay over here? Is this all right for you? And are you okay over here? No, peacemaking is, is the together piece. And uh, I, the, 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 it's hard. It's awkward. It's, it's uncomfortable. But I think that the Lord will give you organic ways to help with this reconciliation piece. And the reason I'm going into so much depth on this one alone is I think that this is the one that hits us more, most closely to home. And the Lord can reveal just really creative ways for you to, to do this. If you're sitting there right now and you're like, you know what, Angela, I don't know. I don't know how to bridge this gap. You know, I just really encourage you or challenge you to pray about it. And maybe today, this week, he'll just bring something to your mind that'll just spark something in you. Like, hey, let's send a text. You want me for coffee this week? I mean, it's pretty benign, right? Anybody, letter writers, card writers? I, I, I do that. It's a lost art. But it gives you some time between your words and your thoughts and the emotion where you can send that out and just say, hey, I'm sorry. Or if you don't want to come up with it on your own, go to the card aisle. I crack myself up in the card aisle all the time. Uh, the, the art of an apology has gotten really creative these days. Or those gifts, you know, those uh, video memes that you can send. I mean, again, I, I think humor breaks everything down. And it, we, all, we have a rule in my family that if you laugh first in a fight, fight's over, fight's over. And, and then you come back to the conversation. So pray about it this week. And God will give you some creative and organic ways to make peace if you sincerely ask him to. All right, so the third definition of peace is security, safety, prosperity, and felicity. I love that word. It was a show in the 90s. But it means intense happiness. These are the feelings that we experience when we're free from danger. And when I think of this, there's no better example than when I look at something like this. No, oh, that's my firstborn. That's Elliot. Just safe and sound, right? Secure. Or how about this one? Uh, oh, that's Derek. I also got his permission for this, this photo. Don't worry. <laughs> we have this, I'm just telling you all the details about our, our marriage, but we have this, uh, this, this rule that whoever falls asleep first is going to get a photo taken of them. And we use Snapchat. So, I mean, I've got like tons of photos. So he has tons of photos of me too. Probably less flattering than this one. If you want to see him, you can come see me in the lobby afterwards. <laughs> so how do we make this type of, of peace? Well, the recipe for this one is we've got to secure the surroundings. So before going to bed at night, you guys got a routine, lock the doors. I know you military men do, you service men, you've got the routine down. You lock the doors, turn off the lights, set the alarm. You got a pattern, right? That's what you do. You got to make sure so you can, the surroundings are secured so then you can go to bed peacefully at night. And the making of this piece is so beautifully embodied in Psalm 23, 2, where it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The ISV says it this way. He causes me. See the effort, the, the, the poeo, the making, that, that part. It takes effort for us to be able to lie down in green pastures of green grass. He guides me beside quiet waters. And see, David was the psalmist that crafted this. And he knew a thing or two about sheep because he was a shepherd. And the reason that he used this metaf metaphor is because sheep will not lie down if they sense any danger. If, if there's any presence of any irritant or something that would threaten them, they will not lie down. 
And what happens when a sheep won't lie down, it expends all its energy. Sheep are weird. If they fall over, if they get the, the casting down, it's when a sheep falls down on its belly. They, they have like these, it's weird. It's fascinating, but it's weird. But they can die if they're not in the right position lying down. But when they're standing on end and repeatedly, they use all of their energy to stand. And so what happens is then they can become emaciated, they become weak, and then, beca- then they become... Uh, uh, susceptible to disease and, and infection, and then that can then a- affect the entire flock, right? So knowing this, the shepherd goes before the flock and makes sure that there are no predators. He, he goes ahead of them to secure the area, and his very presence Verses talk about how the sheep know his voice. The very sound of his voice, the, his very presence brings comfort. It says his rod and his staff are an ever-present tool to both guide and defend. That rod is also used as a discipline tool because sheep, while they have some intelligence to them, they're not as dumb as we often think they are, they follow, right? And so the, the, he'll use the rod to redirect and correct. So it's that discipline, right? See how it's all being tied together, the, the discipline-making piece even in this instance? But his very presence brings comfort to them. And see, when you've done your part, when you've made peace with those in your life and done everything that you can do to make peace, then you can experience this true safety and security. And, as, and if, as far as it depends on you, you've done all that you can to seek peace and pursue it, then you have to let it be in his hands. You have to trust that the good shepherd will go before you and his very presence will give you the security and the safety, the prosperity and the felicity, the happiness. And when you've done your peacemaking part, then you can lay your head down at night and say, you know what? God, I have to give the rest to you because it's not my burden to bear. And I have to trust that you go before me. We can't see everything lying in wait, but the shepherd does and he's there to protect. And then that leads me to the next type of peace, the Messiah's peace. The peace, this is the peace of God. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This type of peace is often paralleled to the Hebrew word, which is found in the Old Testament, the word for shalom. You know that word? And that's the Hebrew word for peace. And this is a word that does not mean there is an absence of of chaos, but it's a perfect peace that is complete, whole, and lacking nothing. It is a genuinely perfect peace that's honestly often felt in the midst of a raging storm. This is the peace that you feel as a child of God that makes zero sense. It's the overwhelming peace that I felt when I was 35 weeks pregnant with my second and I started hemorrhaging at home. And when you're a labor nurse, lots of thoughts go through your mind. And so when I was in the back of an ambulance headed to the ER, it was that overwhelming peace that just transcended me as I prayed You know, just, Lord, you know this baby. You love this baby more than I could ever imagine or hope. So I just have to trust that you're the good shepherd and you go before me. It's that overwhelming peace that makes no sense. It was the overwhelming peace that I had when I left my baby at the hospital in the care of nurses and doctors in the NICU. And I just had to trust, God, you love him more than I do. You're there. Your presence is all around. You are, the word calls him Jehovah Shammah. That means he's here, there, and everywhere. So I have to trust that you are my Jehovah Shammah. It's that supernatural peace that a couple years ago when I had a mammogram that detected a mass. And I thought, okay, Lord. And then your mind starts to spin. And you start to think about all the what-if situations and scenarios. But when you stop and grab a hold and, and cast your care, and, get, and take every thought under, under the authority of who he is and who he says that you are, it's that overwhelming peace that just encompasses you. It makes no sense. It was the supernatural peace that two years ago when my nephew was born with transposition of the great arteries. We didn't know it. My, my sister-in-law and brother didn't know it. Some of you in this congregation prayed for my nephew, Luca. 
two years ago. And when five days old, he went into open heart surgery. I mean, his heart, the size of a walnut. And it's like, okay, God, but I had this weird sense of peace, unexplainable. I remember praying in my kitchen as he headed into the OR and I said, Lord, you got this baby. You love him more than anybody else can. So we have to trust that you are there. And it's, it's, the, it's a weird peace that people that are connected to the Prince of Peace, to Jehovah Shalom, only know. You can only, people in your life that if you, if you, can any of you relate to that? When you've gone through something that you're like, hey, it makes no sense. And, and to be clear, it's not foolishness, right? It's not like, oh, I'm just gonna be, you know, absent-minded and I, it's not foolishness. It's just this supernatural um, enveloping of divine peace that can only come from on high. Some of you guys can relate, right? And it's that, just that endowment of that overwhelming sense, you know what, everything's gonna be okay even when the situation says it not. it's not because he's sovereign. And, and even if it's not with, by the world's stance, it's okay because Messiah, you ha- I have your peace. It's a peace that surpasses human understanding. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of what? Christ's blood on the cross. We have the peace of God. As as believers in Jesus, you have the peace of God because Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice so that we can have peace with God. See, the recipe for this one is, this doesn't take anything on your part. Jesus already made peace by sacrificing his life so that you and I would not have to. But in order to have the Messiah's peace, even though we don't make this one, we have to receive it. We have to accept it. Some of you are, you're just, you're going through it right now. Yeah, you've, you've said, said the sinner's prayer and you said, Jesus, come into my life, but you're not operating within this gift. We have the gift of his spirit and the fruit of his spirit, one of which is peace. And some of you are just, you know, your world's in chaos. You lay your head down at night and just, it's swimming. You can't sleep because you're just, thoughts, you have no peace because you're not tapping in to the authority that you have as a child of God. And this leads me to the next piece. This is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation. For those who have accepted Jesus, this is the intimate knowledge that our Savior overcame death and we don't have to fear it. I love how 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says it. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Other versions say, when this perishable puts on imperishable, and when this mortal puts on immortality, then death is swallowed up in victory. See, no matter what we experience on this side of heaven, we have the Messiah's peace within us and our salvation is secured. This is the person that's sitting here, if you left this building, got in your car and got into a deadly accident on 23. Every every year we see accidents on 23 out there. This is the person that knows that if that were to be you, you'll 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 be okay because you're gonna meet your savior face to face. This is a person with a terminal illness. I know somebody in here has a diagnosis that's ever front in their face. Your mortality is ever present in your mind. But you have a peace because you know your eternal destination. My friend Patty, she just passed away of metastatic cancer uh, about a month or so ago. And even though, she, I promise you, she did not want to die, but she didn't fear it because she had the peace of a soul assured of her salvation. She fully understood 2 Corinthians 5, 8, where it says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Is your soul assured of its salvation? 
Do you have this peace? See, once you receive that gift of salvation, you are immediately, instantaneously adopted into the family of God. Instantly. And that's the promise that he gives us in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are to be, for they will be called children of God. And as a child of God, I have all the rights, all the privileges, all the authority of heaven. And only a child of God can truly understand and receive divine peace. And that will then lead us to this final definition. And as I give the definition, I just want to invite the band to come out. But the last one is the blessed state of the devout and upright after death. What the heck does that mean? (laughs) It's the tombstone that says R-I-P, rest in peace. When there's absolutely zero question that you are truly resting in perfect peace. As you guys know that that acronym R-I-P is initially represented as a Latin phrase, requiescat in pace. I just love the sound of that. And it means may they rest in peace. And historically, this was only ever placed on a Christian tombstone. This is the peace that's indicative of a person who has left a legacy of a life pointing others to Jesus. And the fruit of their life unequivocally says, you know what? Even in death, we can celebrate her life because we know she's with Jesus. Or you know what? Yeah, we're, we're sad. We mourn for our loss, for, for him not being here with us anymore. But I promise you, he doesn't miss us for one second because for certain he is resting in peaceful eternity and not in the unending torment of hell. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't wanna leave this life with any hint of any doubt that when I breathe my last breath here, my next will be in heaven. I want my funeral to be a celebration and not a question of where I'll be for eternity. John eleven twenty five 25 says, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. That's really hard for our human minds to wrap sense around. But right now in this moment, I wanna make room for each person here to receive that gift of peace, receive the gift of salvation. You're like, you know what, Angela? I don't have peace because I don't have God. My marriage is a mess. There's no peace with my kids, my family, my job, whatever that situation, whatever right now that you're going through that you could pinpoint peace, the relationship, the situation, whatever it is, I just wanna make room right now to give you space to accept that gift. So will you all just bow your heads with me right now? If there's anybody here doubting your eternity, Would you be brave enough to admit that to yourself and to God? Because guess what, guys? He already knows. If you could say, you know what, Angela, I don't want to doubt that at the end of this life, I'll truly be resting in peace with Jesus. Would you raise your hand? I see you. He sees you. He sees you. He knows your heart. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? You know what? I'm not, I, I'm not, not at peace. I don't know if, if, if I breathe my last breath here where I would be. I'm doubting that. Thank you. Thank you. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you raised your hand, will you pray this prayer out loud with me? And everybody else here will pray with you. So you, you, can, you, you were brave enough to raise, but will you be brave enough to pray together? Everybody else pray. Heavenly Father, I want to receive your peace. I want to be a soul assured of my salvation. I want to be your child. I know that I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me I believe that Jesus died for me. 
so that I could live boldly for you. Today, I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I'm so excited for you. You know those photos of the soldiers coming home to be reunited? That's what every angel in heaven is doing right now. Your soul has been reunited in perfect residence with your heavenly father. Amen, amen. I just thank you guys. And I just want this word just to stick with you this week. Be a peacemaker. Because those that carry that Irene or that Shalom, it spills out from you. And you invite other people into that space. And they see that in you. And they think, what does she have? What does he have? Because you are a child of God. Will you stand now and worship with us? Thank you.